Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you all to our uh, first Power of Diversity lecture series uh, for the 2021-22 academic year. Uh, I'm Robert Solomon. I serve as Vice President for the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. Uh, we're really delighted to have each of you here, and certainly those of you who are watching uh, through live stream, we welcome you uh, as well. We know that in our uh, COVID protocols, we have a limitation of the number of people that we bring together. Uh, so we have an, an intimate group here uh, for uh, our lecture, and we know there'll be some more people coming in, but we also welcome those uh, who are joining us uh, through live stream. We're really excited to share with you this particular, particular uh, lecture, which is sponsored uh, by our office along with uh, La Alianza Latina Latino Alliance uh, in combination with Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and we're delighted in many ways uh, to uh, have uh, really the honor of bringing Judge Teresa Molina uh, here to speak and to share her uh, perspective, experience, uh, and her wisdom uh, with the Case Western Reserve uh, community uh, today. I won't spend a long time uh, in our introduction uh, except to, to let you know that uh, Judge Molina is an accomplished uh, trial attorney. Um, she uh, is a native of Cleveland, so she's one of our own, uh, and she is a judge in Cook County uh, in Chicago uh, where she is a circuit judge there uh, having uh, been on the bench for two years, uh, but before then, uh, having spent 18 years as a prosecutor or a state's attorney there, really making a significant impact uh, on the criminal justice system. Uh, what many people don't always appreciate is that you not only need good defense attorneys, but you also need good prosecutors who are fair-minded, who are thoughtful, who are engaging, uh, who value all of the citizens that come before them. Uh, and she's been just that kind of judge and that kind of prosecutor and certainly the kind of lawyer uh, that we want in our criminal justice system. Uh, she has been just a tremendous example. Uh, and I uh, spoke with a group of law students earlier uh, sharing my bias because she's one of my favorite people uh, because of her spirit, her sincerity, and her willingness to engage and to give back to the community as a whole. Uh, so what we'll do is we will uh, allow Judge Molina to come before us uh, in her own way, uh, and then we will uh, reserve some time for a Q&A afterwards. Uh, and so we want you to listen to what she has to say and certainly save some time uh, for a Q&A. So uh, while Judge Molina comes up, I, I ask that let's give her a warm welcome of applause, uh, and I will... Uh, disinfect our uh, our whole microphone system and podium uh, and stop talking so I can stop doing all that. Thank you, Judge Mouille. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to take my mask off. Ah, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Throw that there. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I like these kind of events because I get all warm and fuzzy inside. Oops, the microphone, I'm not used to it. Uh, I get warm and fuzzy because it's a bunch of nice things and who doesn't like nice things being said about them? But I'm truly, truly honored and uh, grateful to be here. Uh, we're gonna take a little trip back 25 years ago. I actually used to work here at Case Western Reserve. I worked as a security guard before they had police here. I was the person that would lock up the buildings and walk people back to their cars. And I had high hopes and dreams of going to law school. Um, I kind of came to Case to maybe try to, they didn't have a part-time program at the law school, but you could get tuition for free if you worked here and that sounded great to me. But then it was gonna take too long and so then I just worked here for a few years. And I'll tell you this, there's certain jobs you have in your life and I hope you've had one already where you just love your job. Every day, it doesn't feel like work. And that's what it was like working here at Case. I worked with a great team of people. We used to have so much fun here. And I, on my days off, I'd kind of be a little bit bummed that I didn't have to go to work. Now, that's a great job. I've only had one other job that's been like that, and that's the job that I have now as a circuit court judge. But um, it's really an honor to be here, especially 
after 25 years of being here as an employee to now be back here as a guest speaker, I thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm happy to be here for Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, or half a month and half a month, actually. Uh, that's kind of non-committal, but I, I like, oh, a Browns fan, my new favorite person. Let's go. <laughs> go Browns. I'm clearly still from Cleveland. Um, even though I've been in Chicago almost 20 years, my heart is still in Cleveland, and I uh, enjoyed that victory this weekend very much and uh, made sure all my coworkers know, uh, knew that I enjoyed it. Uh, but Hispanic Heritage Month, also another opportunity to speak and um, r remind us that, you know, we still have a lot to do, uh, an impact to be made, and I'm happy to be a speaker here. I can uh, tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that I went through to get to where I was, but it's, it's an honor to be a speaker for Hispanic Heritage Month as well. Uh, I am 100% Puerto Rican, and most Puerto Ricans, if they're 100%, they will tell you that within five minutes of meeting them. I am no different. And so I was born here in Cleveland on the west side, and then we moved back to Puerto Rico um, because my sister had asthma and needed to breathe. She's here today, too. <laughs> and so then um, I learned Spanish first as my language, and then we came back here to Cleveland like four years later, and so I didn't know any English. And my sister would watch cartoons on the TV and I would tell her in Spanish, don't watch those cartoons. I said, those cartoons are bad. They speak English. You know, like it was an awful thing. But apparently I learned that I had to learn English to get through and head start and, and you know, elementary school. So then I learned English right away. Um, so I always joke that, Span that English is my second language because it really is. I went to uh, St. Joseph Academy, and then I went. I graduated from VA St. Joe's on the east side, even though I lived on the west side. That's another long story. Ended up going to Ashland University for my undergraduate study. Um, the way I chose Ashland was my best friend and I wanted to go to college together. And she wanted to major in psychology, I wanted to major in criminal justice. Um, back then, you literally had a book with all the colleges, and you would, you know, find the majors. So there were six schools that had both of our majors. This is how we picked our school. So we went to visit the first one. Our parents weren't really involved. Somebody, her stepdad drove us there. My mom picked us up. We did our college visits on our own. We, we were just kids. And we went to Ashland, and Ashland had award-winning dining services. And as you can see, I'm a woman that can appreciate award-winning dining services. And so that's how I ended up going to my school. So don't pick a school like I did. But it worked out and um, went there and then came here and ended up working here at Case. Then it was law school time, and uh, I, I ended up at The Ohio State University. Very happy to be there. Yay, all the Buckeyes. But, um, you know, law school was a little bit different for me because the way I was raised, it was very collaborative. If, if, if you needed these sheets of paper and I had them, here, take them. I have three, you can have one and a half, you could take them all. That's how I was raised. At, at Ohio State for law school, and every school is different, some people there didn't want you to have what they had. For example, I missed a day of class because I had a migraine. Can I get your notes from class? Well, some people would happily hand them over. Other people were of the mind that if I give you my notes, you might do better than I, than I will, and I don't want to mess things up for myself, so I'm not going to help you. And so that was different. That was difficult for me to adjust to because that's not how I was raised. And so you just, what, you had to, what I had to do was find like-minded people, people willing to share what they had, what they knew, and, and surround myself with people that were similar to me in that way. And luckily, I was able to do that. I was the uh, president of the Hispanic Law Students Association for two years while I was there, a member all three years. Um, we were a very, very small organization. I'm talking less than 10 of us in the whole law school. And um, in Columbus, there was also K uh, Capital University. And so Capital had a, another small Hispanic uh, Law Students Association. So we would do things in conjunction with them just so we could have numbers at our events. And uh, I'm, the president there was a young lady named Lisette uh, Rivera. She was from Chicago. So during my second year, I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor. And during my second year of law school, um, I went to the career service office and just happened to see a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, literally a sheet of paper like photocopied. And um, at that time, law firms would come and recruit heavily. They would have these beautiful displays and they would give out, you know, notepads and pens and all kinds of stuff and this was just one sheet of paper on the wall and so but it said prosecutorial opportunity symposium and it was going to be held in Chicago and I had 
I don't even think I had ever been to Chicago at the time, but I was interested in going somewhere um, like Chicago where there were more Puerto Ricans than in Cleveland, but not so many like New York. So that was my kind of balance. And Chicago's still driving distance so I could see my grandmother at the time. So I called Lisa from Capitol and I said, hey, are you going to Chicago you know, this particular weekend? She said, yes. Can I spend the night at your house? I want to go to the symposium. And so she let me, and I didn't know at the time, but I was staying in Humble Park, which is the big Puerto Rican neighborhood in Chicago. And I went to the symposium at my second year of law school, and there um, were four different agencies, but at the table there were women that looked like me doing the job that I, that I wanted to do. There were female Latina prosecutors. And in my whole life, I had never met anyone like that. So, you, you know, you're young and you're impressionable and I was just blown away. And then they were very friendly. They were nice. They were inviting. They told me how great the state's attorney's office was, how they work collaboratively, how it's open door and you bounce ideas off of each other. And I just couldn't believe that such an opportunity would exist. And they told me, come and interview. You would love it here. We'll help you. And I, I came back. That was my second year of law school. My third year of law school, they did the symposium again. I went back. I met more people. And then I actually, at that time, applied to the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. What I didn't know then was that out of all of the applications that they received, uh, only 3% of the people that actually apply get hired. And so I had my first round interview when I was back in Chicago for the Hispanic National Bar Association convention. And unfortunately, I was very sick um, that weekend when I went to Chicago. And they had an event on a boat, like a dinner event. And I had a little coughing fit. So I went to the ladies' room so as not to be rude and coughing all over you know, at the table. And I just kind of sat there and was coughing. And this woman comes in and she's like, are you OK? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I just have a little bit of a cold. I'm sorry. You know, oh, I hope you feel better. Thank you. You're so nice. And um, I you know, gathered myself and then went back out. Didn't stay. I stayed as long as I could. And then we got back. Well, I had to stay because it was a boat. So then we got back. <laughs> I didn't have a choice to leave. But we get back. And the next day is my first round interview. So I'm ready for this interview. And I go to the interview. And guess who's interviewing me? the lady from the bathroom. You know why? Because God loves me and I have good luck. Um, and so it was just amazing because she already knew I was sick. And then to see me there for the interview, even though she knew just last night I wasn't feeling well. And it was another Latina that was interviewing me. So I felt really good about that. And I had several interviews um, and ultimately got hired by the state's attorney's office. Um, when I was going to move here my, or to Chicago, my grandfather says, oh, you're moving to Chicago. I have um, a cousin there named Charlie. And uh, I haven't talked to him in years. This is back in 2000, 2001. So it wasn't like now with cell phones and everything. So I get on the internet. Why? Because I'm the greatest granddaughter ever, to try to find Charlie Flores. And I look, and somehow I find him. I'm not sure how, because Charlie's real name is Gonzalo. And so I get him on the phone, and him and my grandfather get, and they talk on the phone. These, they hadn't talked in years. They were first cousins. So Charlie says to me, your Pedro's granddaughter, your family, come over. And I was like, oh, OK, that's really nice of you. So uh, one day I was kind of homesick, studying for the bar. I was living in DeKalb at the time, because um, I went there for a bar review. And um, I, I went over on Father's Day of 2001. I get to Charlie's house, and it's overflowing with people because Charlie has a huge family and none of them are quiet, not one. And I know Puerto Ricans can be loud, but these are like especially loud Puerto Ricans. And so Charlie's like, come here, Teresa, sit down next to me, your family, your family. And um, I sit down and he's introducing me to everybody. So like the warmest of warm welcomes. And he tells me, um, you know, when you move here, you can come live here. I've got an extra bedroom. I've got an extra bathroom, whatever you need, your family. And I smiled. And I said, oh, thank you, Charlie. In my mind, I'm thinking, you exercise poor judgment. You don't know me. Um, I'm not going to live with you and your loud family. But that's really nice. Um, but I didn't say any of that. When I got hired by the state's attorney's office, I had one week notice. I passed the bar. I let them know. They said, you start in a week. Well, remember, I didn't really know Chicago, even though I decided I was going to go live there for a few years. Um, and so I kind of called Charlie back up. Hey, can I take you up on that room? And he's like, of course. So I moved in with Charlie and his wife and their, um, their son, who was, he was like 16 at the time. There was a foster son that they had adopted. And uh, I lived there, it was fine. I lived there for three months with Charlie. And it, it turned out Charlie wasn't crazy. He didn't exercise poor judgment. He just was that kind of a person. He, was, he wanted to help everyone and anyone he could. And Charlie ended up being one of my best, well, he's, 
I call him my Uncle Charlie because he was older, but he ended up being one of my best friends. He was a hilarious man. He was wonderful. He, he just was the life of every, he would light up a room. And um, I, I just, I'm so grateful to have had that opportunity to meet him and, and live with him. So I moved out after a few months and I worked at the state's attorney's office. And, uh, you know, working at the state's attorney's office, well, going to Chicago, I thought I was going to see more Puerto Ricans. I didn't know that for every Puerto Rican in Chicago, there were 10 Mexicans. Um, so it was a lot of Latinos, a lot of Mexicans. Well, Mexican Spanish and Puerto Rican Spanish, it's all Spanish, but it's different. So there's different words that you have to know. So little by little, I learned those words. And Part of my early career, I worked in domestic violence, and some of the women there, especially the ones that would speak Spanish, you know, would come up to me and were happy to see a prosecutor that spoke Spanish, and I could talk to them and just, uh, you know, explain things to them. But sometimes, um, you know, I think as a lawyer, as a young lawyer, I thought, I'm going to give you good advice and you're going to follow it. And it was working in domestic violence that I learned, thankfully, early in my career. I can give people information that's good, but it doesn't mean they're going to follow it. And so I had a lady that came up to me, Senorita Molina, do you remember me? She's all bruised up. And I was like, maybe, like vaguely, you look familiar. And she told me, she's like, last time you told me to leave my husband, um, and I didn't, but this time I'm going to. And so I realized at that moment that even though she didn't follow the information, she didn't leave him like I told her she needed to, but she heard what I was telling her. So that taught me a lesson early on in my career that part of my job was just giving information. When you're ready to leave, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have money put away. You're going to have somewhere to go. Little by little, you're going to have clothes somewhere else. You're going to have resources. Here's the phone number for the domestic violence hotline. Um, different things that I could give people so that they knew what to do when the time was right for them. So that was something um, that I was happy to do, especially they might not have uh, had somebody that would speak Spanish to tell them all of these things, but I was there and I was grateful for that opportunity to do that. Um, you know, being a Latina in the office, uh, people would tell me, like, don't you feel like you're prosecuting your own people? But it's true. There were, there were a lot of, you know, defendants that look like me. However, um, I had a chance as a prosecutor to make a difference as to what cases come in. I had a chance as a prosecutor to decide what offers were appropriate. I had a chance as a prosecutor to speak with the people, um, victims of crime, defendants, accused uh, individuals. If they wanted to talk and the state and the police brought me out, I would talk to defendants. And so I'm sure, and I can, I can tell you this a million times, when they say the state's attorney is on her way to speak with you, I am not what they expected to walk in that room. And you would see it on their face. Oh, even in the courtroom, um, you know, I wasn't always what people expected the state's attorney to look like. Uh, I would get a lot of, are you the interpreter? Or, oh, good thing you're here, you know? And I would say, no, I'm not the interpreter, but I can call them for you. Um, so it, just things like that that happen. And it's fine. Like, the interpreters do a heck of a job. If you, if you can speak Spanish and translate it, especially all the technical words, it's a it's very difficult job. And so I'm not taking anything away from them. But, you know, it's interesting that a lot of people d wouldn't see me as an attorney. They would just see me as a Latina. Um, so that was interesting. But, and as a woman, too, sometimes I had um, certain male attorneys would maybe talk louder to me. You know, as if they were not yelling, I wouldn't dare say yelling, but you know, I would kind of look at them and say, is there a reason why you're yelling? Or is there a reason why you're talking so loud? And they, you know, they didn't expect it, oh, oh. And then things kind of calmed down. So I always maintain the professionalism, but also you're not gonna talk to me like that. I maintain, I balance the professionalism and the West Side. That's what I would say. Um, as a, as a prosecutor, I had a chance to try a lot of interesting cases, a lot of sad cases. People sometimes ask me what was uh, something that I didn't expect that would occur as a prosecutor, what, what did I not expect to see? And I think I go back to domestic violence. Um, when we think domestic violence, we think maybe husband-wife violence or boyfriend-girlfriend, but part of that was uh, you know, children being beaten by their parents, and that was very, very difficult for me to see. Um, 
just the horrible things that people can do to children. But the kids were so strong and so resilient, and that was encouraging. But I think that part was most difficult for me. Uh, as a prosecutor, we tried a case where a mom was beating the kids, and she beat them so much, but there were, like, people would see bruises, but there were never witnesses other than the bruises. And um, these kids were very damaged. And we actually tried the case without putting the kids on as witnesses because the doctor testified that they would be so damaged. Um, so it was very interesting. Um, it was unusual and we were able to successfully prosecute that case. And it just so happened to be in front of a judge who was very, very uh, protective of children. So mom um, spent uh, a lot, a few, several years in uh, prison, but, um, and the kids are gonna be better with counseling. And so never the same, but better. So it's just, you know, some of the things that people do to children, I think were shocking to me in my career. Now as a judge, how did I become a judge? Uh, well, with, by the grace of God, basically. I, uh, I applied for a, a sub-circuit position, meaning in, in Illinois, you can become a judge by running in an election and winning. You can get voted in as an associate judge um, by the circuit court judges, or you can uh, be appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court. I applied to be appointed by the Supreme Court for a sub-circuit position. So you have uh, at-large positions, which is all of Cook County, and then you have sub-circuits. If you think neighborhoods, there's 15 sub-circuits. So there was an opening in my sub-circuit, and I applied. And I didn't, um, I, I made it through the screening process. I made it all the way to the interview with the Supreme Court Justice. And she told me, you know, Teresa, you're wonderful. Your resume is impressive. Everyone has good things to say about you. You know, but some people have to go through this process a couple times and, you know, you, you'll, be, you'll be great, you know, but good luck to you. So I was kind of bummed, like, oh, I didn't get the, you know, I didn't get it. And I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself that day. And then I thought about it. I was like, I moved to a city where I knew no one. I worked as a prosecutor for 15 years, three years as a, pros as a chief of prosecutions for the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation. I came here knowing no one, yet professionally, people have nothing but good, well, mostly, I'm assuming, good things to say about me. And you know, then I, st I was like, I I've accomplished something. So then I stopped feeling so sad and felt a little bit better. The next day, I had no idea, but Justice Burke called me and said, hey, do you want an at-large position? And I said, of course I do. <laughs> so I was really lucky because I had no idea it was going to happen that way, but it did. Once I got appointed to fill out a vacancy, then I had to run my election. And that was a whole other uh, uh, ex experience. There's a lot of things to Chicago politics. If, you might, if you're not from there, I'm sure you've heard, that can be uh, challenging. And uh, Chicago is a town of we don't want anyone that no one sent. We don't want any, nobody that nobody sent. So it's, it's, you got to know a lot of people there. And I, everyone wanted to know, who does Teresa know? And I wanted to know, who do I know too? Because I'm just amazed that this is all happening for me. But um, I became a judge. I'm currently assigned to the traffic court, um, to traffic court where I mostly hear DUIs, driving on suspended or revoked licenses, no insurance tickets. I've done some um, Gerstein hearings where if a defend, or an offender is in custody for more than 48 hours, the police bring them and we have a hearing as to whether or not they can keep them or whether uh, the defendant or the offender has to be released. Um, and usually those are on murder cases because those take a little bit longer sometimes, especially if they catch the person right away and they don't have a bunch of other witnesses locked in. Um, so it can, it, they can be in custody a little bit longer but you know, I, I decided when I was gonna be a judge that I was gonna treat people with respect. And I, I do that because that's the way we were raised. And so when people come into my courtroom, well, a couple of things happened. First of all, let me tell you, the first time I came out on the bench and the deputy announced, you know, all rise, the Honorable Judge Teresa Molina, the whole courtroom stood up and I was all excited. He's walking out there. And I saw an Illinois State Trooper. He was African American. He had a sleeve covering his tattoos. And he was standing there and he, I saw, he looked at me and he nodded. And I knew what that meant. And so I looked at him and I nodded back like, that's right, we're doing this. Um, and it felt so good. It felt so, so good because I knew he was happy to see me. Not that I was going to be biased in favor of him, but it just was a sign of respect. And it was such a great experience. Um, and I, I've been told a lot of times, I, you could see it on people's faces. When I walk in the courtroom, especially the Latinos, they're, oh, like this, you know, they look at me like they're not expect. I'm not what they expect, you know. I think when, if, if I would have told you, come in this room, close your eyes and picture a judge. Most of you are going to picture an older white man, maybe with some bushy hair, right? Um, but 
I am proud and happy to try to change that experience. And I'm trying to treat people with respect. You know, when I was a state's attorney, I told this story earlier, but when I was a state's attorney, I had um, a partner who uh, was above me, and so sometimes people would come into the courtroom, oh, did you call such and such case? And she would flat out ignore them. I thought that was weird, because I talked to everybody. And so um, it, she was, I said, oh, did you answer their question? No, that's the defendant's family. Okay, but they still had a question. Like, we represent the court system. You have to represent it well. How hard is it to tell them that the case hasn't been called because it's passed for litigation? But, you know, just things like that. And I feel like you learn as much from people who, who do things poorly, and when you see it, than as the ones who do it well. I had some partners that were great, but I made sure that I was that person that went back and said, we didn't call the case. It's going to get called in a half hour. The judge wants to clear out some other cases first. It, treating people with respect, whether they're the defendant's family, whether they're your victims, whoever it is. You know, you're a representative of the court, and you have a responsibility to serve the public and to do it well and with respect. So I feel like that was uh, a good experience for me to learn from her. Right now, as a judge, what do I do? I try to give people in my courtroom all the information they need. Um, most of the time, it's, like I said, these tickets. Maybe if they plead guilty to a ticket and now they're ordered to pay $354. Okay, so nobody gives them a sheet of paper. This is where you pay. This is how you pay. It's like, okay, you can pay that. Come back on November 3rd and show me your confirmation number. But they're not giving them the information. What I, we're doing court by Zoom now, so I'll put the information on the screen. I show it to them. I put their ticket number. I put uh, how much they owe, and then I ask them, do you have any questions? Do you understand everything I've told you? Why? Because now they have everything they need in order to pay that ticket off and be done with it. They don't have to go looking for it, because some people, if they got to go looking for it, they're not going to pay it. They're not going to pay it. Their license is going to get suspended. They might not realize it because they've moved. They might realize it and not care. And then it's just going to compound issues when if you set them up for success, things will go a lot better. I also make sure to talk to people with encouragement in court. You know, as, uh, you know you're going to come back with community service. I want to see what you've done. I'll be here on November 3rd to see what you've done. Don't disappoint me. Just that little bit of words makes a personal connection, and I think it, it really helps people um, when, especially with the younger folks, the older uh, people in court, they don't need that much. But the younger ones, they need some accountability, and so I try to do that. A um, couple things about when I ran for judge. Uh, couple tips or things to, to remember. We sometimes like to think that our people, our own people, will be the best ones there to help us. You know, oh, he's Puerto Rican, he's gonna help me. Um, but sometimes you'd be amazed. I had an experience where I uh, went to see a local person. You know, you have to have support from the Democratic community. And I went to see a local person and he says, oh, Teresa, um, nice to meet you. Your resume is great, but you know, I got people that need to get hired. They gotta print stuff for you. They gotta pass out palm cards. We're gonna need a lot of donations. Oh, well, I'm glad that my resume means nothing. He didn't care. He didn't care what I'd done. He, all he cared about was how much money he could get from me. And that bothered me for several reasons. First, I didn't have a lot of money anyway. Um, but mostly, I, would, I thought that he would help me. Like, he'd be excited to see a qualified Latina candidate there running for judge. But he wasn't. He was just excited to see money coming. And so um, I just thanked him, but I didn't give him any money. And uh, it just showed me again, early on, that not everybody that you think will be your friend or that will help you think will help you is going to be there to help you. So even your own people. And I encourage each of you, when you're in a, a position to help people, don't be like him. Don't be the person that's going to help others just to put money in your pocket. Do it because it's right. Do it because you want to see Latinos succeeding. You want to see African Americans succeeding. You want to see more, a more diverse bench. You want to see a, a, a judicial community that's reflective of the community it serves. That's the reason to do things. Like, do it for the right reasons. Um, I think that I've had an opportunity to help mentor young students, uh, law students, and again, it's been whether they've been Latino, whether they've been just law students that have come through to volunteer, and I teach them, you know, from jump. If you're here and you think you're better than, you know, making copies, then you can leave now because day one, if you're not making copies, I gotta make copies, so don't think you're too good to make copies. A lot of you know, students want to come in and, oh, I want to go and try a trial. I want to cross-examine the defendant. Well, that's not happening, because it took me years to do it. Um, 
but you know, you got to teach them early on. But I found that my experience was any law clerks I got from Jump, from that I got to train them, they ended up being really good, and a lot of them got hired by the state's attorney's office because they knew that they had to put in the work, and they were willing to put in the work. So my my advice is be willing to put in the work. Don't think that you're going to start here when it's your first day. But what I do say is take the people that you meet, these mentors, and use the heck out of them. Use these people that say they'll be there to help you. Call me anytime if you need something. I, I, abu I didn't abuse it. I used it. I had a mentor who gave me her phone number and said, call me anytime you need anything. And one day, lo and behold, at 3.45 a.m., because I was working at that time, we had felony reviews, so the state's attorney would go out all, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and talk to defendants. And I had a problem that day, and I needed help. And so I called her at 3.45 in the morning, and she helped me. And so try to be that person. Um, you know, try to always be willing to help people. And, and she was. She was wonderful. But use them. Ask them, what, what helped you the most? What do you look for? Um, I met with some law students uh, this afternoon, and they had wonderful questions about, you know, what kind of qualities do you look for when you're hiring people? How do you go to, you know, try to do these internships or work in these places when you need to make money and they're not paying. And sometimes those are difficult things. Uh, I suggested working it backwards. What's the job you really want? Okay, and you identify that job, then you see what experience you need to get there. And if it means you have to volunteer and work for free, then you're gonna have to make money at some other point in the day or some other way, or unfortunately maybe take a loan, but you have to be creative to get to where you want. But people are always willing to help you. Lawyers love um, themselves, and so if you say, hey, can I shadow you for a day? Can I come watch you? Can I come see what you do? We love it. I, I, I've never known a, a lawyer to say no to that. So take that chance and, and learn from them, see them, see what they do. Um, you know, working here at the law school, I used to go and I would find printouts of, of case law. You know, people would have stuff and they'd print five copies and I would find it and I would read it and I was very interested in it. No one's interested in those printouts um, except people not in law school. Um, <laughs> so I would read them and I was like, oh, this is so cool. But, you know, find, find ways to learn, find ways to do things and, and really stay interested or, or just different opportunities to learn stuff, but always be willing to help. Um, part of being your best self and being of service to your community is taking care of yourself. A lot of people want to travel when they retire and do all kinds of things when they retire. My suggestion is do it now. Tomorrow's not promised. I'm a big traveler, but I think traveling has made me a better judge because you, the more people you know, the more familiar everyone is in your courtroom, right? Um, I, uh, Chicago has the second largest Polish community in the country. Um, and so we have a lot, a lot of Polish there. And so in court, before court, sometimes we would um, find out who needed the interpreter. So I would say, hay persona aquí que hablan español, you know, and nobody would care because I was speaking Spanish. But then I would say, movi mi popolsku, pocekać na tu macha. The whole room would stop because I was speaking Polish. I just learned phrases, that's all. But, you know, trying to figure out who, who needed help and who didn't. But the more you meet people that are different than you and learn from them, the smaller your world is. And I'll tell you this, every single time I spoke Polish, the people would be happy. They would light up like, oh, wow. And we have Polish interpreters in court. We had Spanish interpreters. And we can get any other language. But Polish and Spanish, we had all the time. But you know, traveling, getting to know people, sometimes the people that are willing to help you aren't the people you think will help you. When I was in law school, um, there was a kid in my class. And he was the one that would always raise his hand and talk, especially one minute before class was over. He had like three part questions. And then he would stand and come and talk to the professor while you had a legitimate question. And he's just yapping. Craig Allison is his name. And, um, <laughs> Craig's a wonderful person, but he talked too much. And I would tell him, oh, you talk too much. And so fast forward years later, I, um, I got a call from Craig. He was working in Chicago. And he, he took me to lunch and asked me to come work for him. And never in a million years did I think that that's what I would end up doing. But I went to go work for him at the Department of uh, Financial Professional Regulation as his chief of prosecutions in the division of real estate. So I was a, a criminal prosecutor for 15 years. And then it did administrative law for three years before getting on the bench. And that was just a, you know, a, a journey because I didn't know that's where I was going to end up. 
And here's Craig, Mr. Talk a Lot, um, that I had no idea would end up helping me or changing my life so much, but he did. And sometimes the people that are going to help you are people you never foresaw helping you. So be open to having a lot of people help you. Um, be ready for, you know, people that, that are going to, you know, think that you're only getting things because of what you look like. And I challenge each of you, you know, oh, she got appointed because she's Latina. Um, you know what? No, she got appointed because she's qualified and she happens to be Latina. And anytime you hear that, I, I constantly correct people because people want to take away all your experience and all your qualifications and say, she only got it because they needed a woman. He only got it because they needed a, a gay man or a black man or whatever. You know, no, these are people that are qualified that are in these positions. And the more we check people that say things like that, the, the less it'll happen, I believe. Um, so always be mindful of that and, and try to, you know, be somebody that's making things a little bit better. My grandma said, um, poco a poco uno llega lejos. And that, would, that translates to little by little one gets far. And sometimes you might not have all your goals met right away or things happen. You know, you thought you would be at this point in your life, but you're still back here. Just keep pushing. Just keep pushing because maybe it wasn't meant for you then, but it'll be meant for you tomorrow. Just don't stop. Live out your dreams. My dream was to be a judge. It happened in such a fast way that people are still wondering what happened um, with me, and I'm just very blessed. But other people, it's, it's taken a little bit longer, and they keep pushing, and I encourage each of you to, to push. You know, the reason, when I thought about what to say when I came here today, I thought, well, what's the reason I'm here? And I realized the reason I'm here is so that what happened to me doesn't happen to, to you guys, so that when you come here today, you see a Latina judge. I practiced 18 years before I was a judge, 18 years in Chicago. Not once did I step in front of a Latino or Latina judge, ever. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of trials, not one Latino judge, you know? It took me all those years uh, to where I was in law school before I even saw a Latina prosecutor. So, you know, it makes me think, well, what am I here? I'm here so that you see. And, and now it's happening even faster, right? By the time that you're my age, uh, there'll be more of us. And hopefully things will start to be a little bit more balanced. But I hope and encourage each of you to, to remember that and to not give up. Even when things are a little bit difficult, just take a breath and it'll be OK. But just remember, when you get there, help people. I'm always available to help. You know, anything I can do to help people, to explain, to talk about my journey, I'm more than willing to do. But um, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to have the blessed life that I have and to be here today, and I thank you all. We'd like to uh, thank Judge Molina, and uh, what we want to do is to give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, because we're on live stream, we do need you to uh, utilize the mic uh, in order to, to ask questions. Uh, and so uh, I'll bring the mic around. I don't know, do I need, do I need to sanitize it in between <laughs> with my mask on? I don't, I don't know if it's okay. Oh, okay, all right, okay, all right. I'll keep my sanitizer anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, do you all have any questions that, that uh, you have for Judge Molina? We got one back here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's okay. There you go. You gonna take it? Uh, wait a there you go. Thank you. Uh, first of all, can you guys hear me? Uh, Judge Molina, your personality is like phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. Thank you so much for your transparency. Um, I guess my question is. Um, I'm an Afro-Cubana, so another Latina here, and I wanted to know, like, just throughout your journey even before law school and being where you are today, did you deal with imposter syndrome or like how would you battle that throughout your daily life? Um, I think that I f definitely my life experience was one where I was usually one of a few Latinas ever. Um, from elementary school, 
there were some, but then definitely high school. I went to St. Joseph Academy for two years, so it was mostly white girls with a lot of money, um, and that wasn't me. I thought my family was middle class until I learned the term working class and realized that's what we were. So that was kind of funny as an adult realizing, oh, we weren't in the middle. But, um, and then when I transferred schools, it was a little bit more diverse there, um, but at the, when I transferred, I was asked every day, almost every day if, uh, if this was my hair, if these were my eyes, and was I mixed. Um, those were the three questions I got almost every single day. But there were very few Latinos at Villa Angela St. Joseph High School, too. So, and college was the same thing. Um, on my, my name is Teresa, but my family calls me Terry, always has since I was a kid. And so on my floor, there were two Terrys. And one was the uh, girl that lived across the hall. She was white, and then I was, I'm Puerto Rican. So they called me Rican um, because we were two Terries. Uh, and so, you know, it, we were, I felt like it was always just me and a few other Latinos. And so, you know, sometimes you can say, like, oh, I'm so different than everyone and shy away. Or you can say, you know what, I'm, <laughs> and when you're Puerto Rican, this is really your only choice. You say, I'm Puerto Rican, here's how I am. And you tell the world and you share with your world. And what I found is that the more I share about my culture, about m me, about my lifestyle, about parandas or our traditions or the things we do, people are very interested, especially the Puerto Rican food. Everyone's interested in Puerto Rican food. But I found that the more I shared about myself, the easier it was to, for, for me to get to, for other people to get to know me. And now they have positive experiences with Puerto Ricans or Latinos in general. Um, and so to me, again, all of that makes the world smaller. When, when you know people from different groups who are different than you, then I feel like you, you are more compassionate towards everyone. And that's, that's, what I, that's why I like to travel and get to know people and learn different things about different places. So um, yeah, I've, I've always felt like I'm the only one, you know, I'm one of a few, but I still try to, to meet as many people as possible and learn from them. Other questions? Oh, okay. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your lecture. Um, I was facilitating last week and working with um, different people uh, about allyship. So I was wondering if you have any stories where you benefited from the efforts of an ally, uh, someone with privilege who gave you a hand up or gave you an opportunity. So I, I will say that the first example would be Craig Allison, a white Republican who came and asked me to work for him. And I had no idea, but that got me a new job, a job that I was able to learn new things at. Um, when I was in law school, I had a professor who, uh, and I think I can say this, scared the hell out of me. Um, his, his name was Morgan Shipman, and he was as intense as intense can be. Um, but he was a good professor, but I was deathly afraid of him. He also spit when he talked. and. Um, I sat in the front row because I couldn't see or hear very well. So I used to bring my books from all my classes and make like a wall to keep him away. Um, but it didn't matter. He still would come. But he scared me. And I was always so prepared for his class because I was terrified of him. And it ended up being my best grade in law school. I did so well, he hired me to be his research assistant. I worked for him throughout law school, after law school, and this is a southern white man from Texas. After law school, he uh, would write me letters of recommendation and anything you need, Miss Molina, you let me know. And he was wonderful and he helped me. Um, Another example, my sorority. I'm a member, I'm a proud member of Alpha Phi sorority, a traditionally white sorority. But at no point in my, in my years of being an Alpha Phi had they ever made me feel different. It's just always been family to me. And a lot of people are like, well, why would you join a white sorority? I joined a sorority where I felt comfortable. I, felt, I joined a sorority where I was welcomed, where I was loved. And to this day, I still keep in touch with all, most of my pledge class, a lot of my sisters. I do uh, volunteer work with the Alpha Fees in Chicago, and I, I work with part of the Leadership Academy there. So, you know, things that, opportunities from other groups, I, I put myself into, and they've been able to help me. I was a member of the Black Law Students Association the whole time I was in law school. Why? Because these were my friends, and I had fun with them, and we, you know, why not join? I was allowed to join the Black Law Students Association, and I did, and we would study together, and we would learn and we would help each other. So throughout my life, I've constantly been helped by people um, that, that have offered their help to me. And I encourage people, find those people. Sometimes it's not going to be the people you expect, but um, it's, the help is out there. Uh, 
Um, thank you for your talk today. I actually have two questions. So um, it's so just listening to your stories and like uh, through high school and, and college um, and just you as a person and how you've just interacted with the world. It sounds like your mother and your family put a lot of like pride in you. You're very proud of who you are and your heritage and where you've come from. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like the, your, like just growing up and how you just, you never let that, those kind of things like imposter syndrome kind of get you down. Or if you did, like how did you overcome these kind of things? Like from your childhood, what did you utilize in like throughout? your education and my your career. My parents are both, um, let me put this water down. My, my parents are both very uh, chatty, as, as my whole family is very chatty. And so we were raised to be very, very proud of being Puerto Rican. There, I mean, if you go back to when we were kids, we're in every Puerto Rican parade um, in Cleveland when they had them. Um, we were in every parade, we have flags everywhere, um, I think bumper sticker. My license plate to this day is Coqui. Coqui is the Puerto Rican frog that doesn't live outside of Puerto Rico. Um, that's when my license plate is Coqui. So <laughs> when you say I'm proud, I'm proud. Um, but that's just how we were raised. And uh, I think it be, I, maybe it's a little bit easier because to me, it's all I've known, right? All I've known is to be proud to be Puerto Rican. I was telling the, the law students earlier, I used to get mad when I was a prosecutor and I would get arrest reports, and it would tell you the tattoos that the uh, offenders had, and some of the defendants would uh, have a Puerto Rican flag tattoo, and I felt like there should be a rule in life. Like, you can't have the Puerto Rican flag tattoo if you're gonna go commit crimes. If you're gonna do good stuff for the Puerto Rican community, put that flag on you and go represent. And yes, I have a Puerto Rican flag tattoo. Um, but that used to make me mad. But it, we've just always been proud of who we are. It's just, it, it is. And it, to me, it's fun. Like, we share who we are. A lot, you know, I went to Mauritius, and um, I couldn't believe it. But somewhere in the world, people don't know what Puerto Ricans are. Like, I would tell people, they're like, what are you? Because, you know, they've tried to look at me and figure out where I was from. And I'm like, I'm, you know, Puerto Rican. And they're like, oh, I've never heard of that. And I, it was shocking. Think about, I mean, here there's Puerto Ricans everywhere, but if you're somewhere where there's no Puerto Ricans, they had no idea until I said J-Lo. Oh, yeah, 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 we know J-Lo. So that was, that was, you know, but it's so weird to think like that, to think that there's a whole, you know, to me, everybody knows Puerto Ricans, but that was where I learned that. Um, so yeah, I just think it's part of who I am. And, and, and my mom worked at the Spanish American Committee here. You know, my dad was a member of the San Lorenzo Club, which is a Puerto Rican social club. Um, you know, we play dominoes. I don't go out, I don't do any political. The only time I did political functions on Thursday nights was when I was campaigning. Other than that, there'll be a big association meeting or something. I'm not going if it's Thursday, because that's my domino night. That's what I do. I play dominoes on Thursday, and I win. Um, I currently have the trophy. It says, I'm a champ, not a chump. We pass it around every week, whoever wins the trophy. So you have to balance your hobbies, but you know, certain, certain things you just gotta keep doing. And to me, Domino Night, that's my family, those are my friends, that's what I do. But it's just who I've been. What was your second question? I forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't ask it yet. Oh, good, see? Uh, I see. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, so what are some tips you can give for like turning, ex like learning, like getting the best out of a learning experience, like coming into like this seminar or, or shadowing like a lawyer around, like how do you, what, what's some tips you can give? What I would suggest is get as many, get as much experience, as many experiences as possible. But two, when you're doing it, I'm a fan of a notepad or maybe the phone will look like you're playing. But write down questions. Sometimes when you go, if you go shadow somebody and you don't ask them a question, to me it was a waste. I want to know why did you do that? Why did you rule this way? Why didn't you find him not guilty? Why did you? What what you know? What made you do this? Um, ask questions. Um, I think that'll be the best way to to enhance your learning experience. But get Get as many opportunities out there and learn as much as possible so that you can um, have a better foundation on, on what you know. Uh, one of the things I always talk about is, you know, it takes sometimes years to learn the value of something, right? I'm, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I can look at a case and know that this case merits, you know, six months in jail versus, you know, this other case that should be, you know, two years in jail um, because I've seen hundreds and hundreds, thousands of cases. But when you're starting out, you just need to learn how do I do the assessment? How do I figure out that this is a six month case versus a two year case versus a 25 year case? It just takes experience. So learn it, learn it well, and keep practicing it. Um, can you? Go ahead, I can hear you. Can you give any, like, like a more specific kind of tip, like 
for someone with anxiety or someone who th like questions all their thoughts like oh that's a dumb question okay. to like get out of their comfort zone to like ask to do what you're saying to get engaged in their work i would suggest writing down your questions when you have um even if you're afraid of asking them or if it makes you uncomfortable to ask them and then um maybe tell that person if i have any other questions can i email them to you because maybe you don't want to ask face to face because you feel like it's dumb but you can you know you'll feel you know maybe this is a dumb question usually they're not um i've had very very few dumb questions i'm usually uh very good at telling people especially when i was uh, a assistant state's attorney and training law clerks it, or or other attorneys if you have any questions ask me I'd rather you ask me now than mess it up and then we have to fix it just if you're not sure ask me um, and so but if, if it makes you nervous or uncomfortable write it down um, write down questions you have before the experience if you're gonna go shadow someone if you're gonna go sh my experience is prosecutorial so I, I kind of do my examples that way but if you're gonna go shadow a prosecutor think about the questions you might have about that experience beforehand you know why are they uh, prosecuting that case how much time can that person get why was that person uh, not given you know any fines why was that person given more fines you know find all the questions you might have and then once you get in the situation you're probably going to have more just write them down and I think that'll help you um, and then just maybe finding the right mentor right some people will help you but they're not really that helpful there's other people there's other people that'll help um, it's, and sometimes it'll just take time maybe if you work at a place and you you know I had clerks that would bring their friends that were clerks in other courtrooms to talk to me and to come see me and meet me and have me explain things to them because they didn't feel comfortable with the attorneys they were working with but they had heard about me and I was able to you know help them or let them do a trial in my courtroom and stuff like that so just talk to people as much as you can but do it at your pace. You don't have to. You don't have to move at everybody else's speed. They can go around you. Thank you. You're welcome. What do you do? I think first and foremost, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Sergeant Rodney Jordan from Case West Reserve Police Department. Uh, my statement is more of a comment, more so than end with a question. Uh, everything that you guys are hearing right now is a reason why I'm a sergeant right now. I had the opportunity and blessing to work with this woman. Um, I was badge 48 at the time, and um, a lot of the things that I've learned in dealing with general public and students, I learned from her. And first and foremost, I want to thank you because because of that, I received three promotions while working here at Case. And a lot of that I wanted to associate with you because being around you and learning from you um, helped me in my endeavors. I'm, I'm, I'm on 26 years at Case now. Um, I guess my question is that we all know that police is not the most popular career right now. Um, I do the best I can as far as engaging and dealing with people. Um, usually I'm the front line, we're, or we're the front line, and then they come to the system. Uh, is there anything, uh, advice that you can give me that I can enhance to add on to my arsenal uh, when, while dealing, whether it be the students, the faculty, the staff, or the general public? Thank you. Um, I was trying to figure out if that was you, but I couldn't tell with the mask, but yay, I'm so happy to see you. Um, we had a lot, this is part of the reason why I loved working here. Um, we had a lot of fun. Um, advice that I would give to police officers is, uh, I would say, write good reports, because that's always going to save you. Um, as much as I'm allowed, I think that's a general rule I'm allowed to say. Certain things I'm not allowed to comment on. But I think to me, always be the same thing, always be an example. Everything I do, people look at because I'm a judge. So they're watching what I do, they're watching what I say. Um, and not everybody, you know, some people are waiting for me to mess up because they want my job, right? So I have to be an example everywhere I go. I have to try to say the right things, I have to try to do the right things, right? I'm human. Um, but remember that everywhere you go, everything you do, people are watching. And my experience has been for a lot of situations, the best 
thing that you can do is explain to people why you're doing things, right? If they understand you, they might not agree with you, but at least they understand. Everyone here, and I think most of society, understands police have a job to do. Whether or not they agree with what the police are doing or not, but in 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 society, we all understand the role of the police, and uh, some police officers take it too far, right? I'm not. Nobody's going to disagree on that. But in general, just be a good example. Be a good example of what the police should be, and I think that will help people have more trust in the system and in police officers. Yeah. We'll go again. I'll start asking. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, so you you mentioned um, in, like answering my earlier question about like finding someone to like a mentor, but they may not be helpful. So they just find another mentor. In a situation like that, you run the risk of burning bridges. So have you have you ever come across any kind of instances like that where you had to kind of sidestep, make sure you didn't burn a bridge in your career that could have had people saying not so nice things about you? I've had partners that I didn't care for in particular, um, partners that I thought were not as helpful as they should have been, people that kind of say, there it is, go do it, and don't show you really, and so I don't find that helpful. But I think that you can be diplomatic in how you do things. You don't have to say, you know what, you're not helping me. You can just say, oh, thank you, you've been so great. Um, and I also met, you know, Fulana, and I, you know, and talk to her and found out so many things and I just love this whole experience um, or I'm learning so much you don't have to love everything but you don't have to say I don't want to take the advice you're giving me because you're not really helping me you don't have to do that you can just thank them for what they've done and keep it moving to the next person that's going to help you okay this is a, a little off topic but you mentioned a lot about travel and I love to travel. I think meeting new people and new cultures and you know, just experiencing the world. What would you say is one of your favorite trips that you've ever taken? Um, I'd have to go back to Mauritius only because I didn't know where it was or what it was. So here's, and for those of you who are like me, Africa, go east, Madagascar, Go east, Mauritius, tiny, tiny little island, smaller than Puerto Rico, and they speak French there. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful island. It looks a lot like Puerto Rico. And uh, the only reason we went there was because we got a free trip. I, I got a lot of free trips. That's a whole nother lecture I could give. Um, but I'm telling you, I'm so blessed. Um, but, you know, there it was just neat because it was geographically diverse. The people were wonderful. Everybody, it was just different than anywhere I had ever been. So I, if you ever get a chance to go to Mauritius, I highly recommend it. Any others? Any other questions? Oh, I have one. I'm looking at my notes trying to see if I missed anything. Okay. I want to talk about one thing. You know, um, part of being who I am and coming from where I'm from, like I said, we, I thought we were middle class, we are working class. And so to me, a fine of $354, which is our normal no insurance fine, that's a lot of money. And um, some of the judges that I work with, came from money, so $354 is no big deal. But to most of the people that come to my courtroom, it is a big deal. And so I, I always offer them the opportunity to do community service. And um, they just changed the law now in Illinois where the judge can decide how much to pay the, the person doing the community service. So if you owe 354 and I pay you at a rate of $15 per hour, you need to do 24 hours of community service to satisfy all of it. Well, I was talking to one, and I, this just changed like two weeks ago. I was talking to one of my colleagues, and he said, um, I just give them as long as they need to pay it. And I'm like, you know, it's different because I think because maybe he thinks that's the best way, that way they're not as stressed. But for me, I think doing the 24 hours would make me a lot less stressed than having to come up with more money. So I think it's, there's always different approaches in how you handle things. He thinks giving them as long as they need to pay it so they're not stressed about it is the best method. I think letting them do it in a month and get it done and off their plate is a lot easier than making them have to come up with extra money, especially people that have children and have to then get daycare so that they can, you know, go make extra money, like it becomes cumbersome for people. So I think you just have to be creative in how you allow people to, to, to succeed and set them up for success. Um, 
You know, I had a woman who, who her, annu her annual income was $22,000. She had a son in um, college, and she was going to have to pay $354. That's a big amount to her, you know. So I just let her do the community service, and she was very appreciative and very thankful. And it gets it done. So just be creative in when you have to do things, accommodating everyone's situation. Because some people are embarrassed to tell you that they don't have the money or that they can't pay it, you know. Because I'll ask people, you owe $354, how much time you need to pay it? And sometimes people will be a little bit nervous. I'm like, you know, you need two months, you need three months. Like I offer, I give them some cushion so that they don't feel uncomfortable. I don't, you know, I, I tell them, I don't know what's going on in your house. I don't know what's going on with your finances. So, you know, take as much time as you need within reason. That's always the key, within reason. We're not going to be here five years later with you owing 354. Um, I tell them that too. You know, I have a question that really relates to uh, what, what, what I've seen. I think we've all seen is your philosophy and ideology of collab being collaborative and supportive and helping one another. And it seems that in recent years, there's been a kind of a rise in divisiveness and nastiness and, and not really having that kind of concern for our, our fellow person, right? So uh, um, my question is, have you encountered people who have had that kind of mentality? And how do you deal with someone who seems determined to, to have that hard edge and that, that self-centered approach and not concern for others. And you know, how, how do you win them over? Do you win them over? Do you cast them aside? You know, how do you approach that? It depends on who the person is. The beauty of Zoom court is I have control of the mute button. Um, so I love that. Uh, but I can mute people that are like that. I've had that happen. Um, you know, I've had people say some things in my courtroom, maybe, you know, I had a defendant once that said to me, Judge, why is everyone in here look like you and me? Um, and it was a valid question, but it wasn't the time or place for it. And Chicago's a big city, and what would happen is the police would give tickets in certain areas, and those days, those tickets would come to my courtroom. So if you're ticketing in a predominantly Latino or African American community, guess what the courtroom's going to be full of? So it looked like a, a, you know, like a big issue, but if you don't know that part of it, then you can't really say that. So, you know, I said, you know, that's, that's a good question, but not for here. You know, I was like, your case is done, keep it moving. Um, but I have had people that are nasty and, you know, you just, it's hard. One of the things I said when I campaigned was that I was going to treat people with respect and, and that I have the temperament to be a good judge. And sometimes I, I have to, you know, take a deep breath and remind myself what I promised to the voters or to the people of Cook County and actually do the job. It's not always easy to deal with people that are like that. And there's going to be people that are like that. But, you know, I just, as a judge, I, I, you know, I tell them, you'll have a chance to say what you want to say. And then if they're just being nasty, I'm like, you know, your, here's your court date. I'll see you then. You know, it's time to go. Because I, I don't want to, I'm not in there for debate. You know, I don't have to debate. I'm the judge. I get to decide. So they, they, they're just fighting with the wrong person sometimes, but they're usually mad about something else. But I can guarantee you that even those people, with all their nastiness, I'm still going to treat them fairly despite that, because that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the, what I was sworn to do. Thank you. Any final questions? Uh, we, oh, good. We got more. Um, can you comment on how, where your career um, now and previously uh, overlaps with mental health professionals and how that further like assists your job or like affects your job and the people that you see? With regards to mental health, um, I, again, I was a state's attorney, a prosecutor for 15 years in the criminal courts and then three years as a uh, prosecutor in administrative law with real estate. And so with regards to mental health and the mentally ill, I had a chance to work with people that gave services to those individuals. I've had defendants that were um, mentally ill. And, you know, sometimes it's a struggle. Sometimes, I I'll tell you about, there was uh, Romano, Romano Jackson, I think was his name. There was a defendant and he was mentally ill, um, but he would come to court in a blazer and he would use a, a paper napkin as a pocket square. You know, he and he just, he, he was mentally ill and he got on the stand and he said, yeah, I stabbed him. And then he looked at the judge and he said, sorry about that. Um, but but, you know, he, he was endearing, but he was mentally ill. And so he, eventually he went to, you know, a facility to help him for that. 
the man that he stabbed was a man that was living in a single residency occupancy bu building. And that man, we had to find him to bring him to court to testify. He had three teeth. He had about seven layers of clothes on, including gloves. It was July. And me, I'm so focused on my case and like talking to him and like going over the questions I'm going to ask him. And at the end, when we when he finished testifying, he, we came, he came out in the hall and he gave me the biggest three tooth smile and he said, thank you for prosecuting my case. Because this is a man that was mostly homeless and like somebody finally cared about him and he was I mean he was stabbed multiple times it was horrible then I found out the reason he had seven layers of clothes on was because he had flesh-eating bacteria and no one told me until after the fact but that's okay some things happen um, but you know that was that uh, it was interesting so different things happen in life um, but there's been people that give services um, in Chicago or Cook County, they've or the state of Illinois, they've lowered the amount of money that they're using for um, mental health services. So we find more mentally ill people out on the streets. A lot of them are committing crimes, which is obviously unfortunate because you have completely innocent victims, you know, being punched or stabbed while walking down the street. Um, so definitely have seen a rise in those types of cases. Um, with regards to services, I'm hopeful that there's, there'll be more. We have uh, specialized courts for the mentally ill and where they try to get them some more treatment. Um, but I think we're looking at it a little bit more now because the numbers are up and hopeful that more services will be available. But we need funding. Uh, Judge Molina, as a Cleveland native and somebody that's worked here at Case Western Reserve, I think you know that there's somewhat of a bubble around University Circle and this school and the rest of the overall Cleveland community. So what are some of your thoughts on overcoming this bubble and letting students or people around here in university in general engage with the rest of Cleveland? That's a good question. Um, I think that any university tends to have its own culture, right? Every school has that feeling of community within the school, but we are part of our overall community. And so I think having programs that are open to the community that aren't just for students, I think having students volunteer or work at different programs or community sites within the surrounding neighborhoods um, to help make the residents that are nearby feel a part of this community, of the whole Cleveland community versus just the Case Western community. So I think just engaging is the, is the difference. Well, with that, we're, we are going to uh, close out. Please give a warm congratulations to Judge Molina for her thoughts. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, allow Judge Molina to hang around a moment for those of you that would just like to have uh, some one-on-one -on -one conversation a little bit further. I really appreciate it. So thank you all so much for joining us.